It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. I think it's um, uh, when you have such nice friends, it feels uh, welcome, welcoming from all of you. Uh, it's good, I guess, the level of progress uh, that we've made in emergency medicine or that uh, people I used to work with many years ago in the beginning of uh, emergency medicine or in toxicology, like I guess uh, Barry Rumack is here. He and I worked together for many, many years continuously. Ben Honigman, who says he's no longer working in the emergency room, is in the dean's office. In the, when we began emergency medicine, one certainly would never have considered that an emergency physician would be in a dean's office. Now, there are many places across the country that's the case. I don't know that that's necessarily the place that I would like to go, but it shows that people can go there. I, I, my story has a lot to do with the, more the deans I couldn't get along with, and I usually uh, uh, lasted very limited amounts of time in my relationships, and that was probably in the beginning of what I thought emergency medicine had to be. Uh, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the concept of whose hospital this is anyway. You know, that hospitals exist for the care of people. Uh, and some of the, the, you know, the great stories come about hospitals. Uh, you might, some of you might have read Victoria Sweet, who writes about uh, Laguna Honda in San Francisco and where people went and who had the right to go there, what it's about, and really where she worked on this concept of uh, fast medicine, but her book became slow medicine, what it meant to be able to do all the things that you see that a patient needs, and you can't do very well without getting that person's narrative and understanding the vision uh, that the patient has and you have. So for me, being here uh, and talking with you is a lot like being at New York University and Bellevue Hospital, just as the Denver General had a fine emergency medicine effort uh, before the university did, Bellevue had a fine history of uh, more than 200 years uh, before there was an emergency medicine effort at uh, the university. So how you solve those problems and look at the people and the process is a good bit of what I'm going to do. Um, let me see if I can. So I think these were objectives I was supposed to uh, speak for and sort of the philosoph philosophic principles. And for me, an awful lot of this is about philosophy. Um, and I'd like to look with you at the, uh, the really significant events that uh, transformed our specialty. It's from my perspective, obviously. A lot of that is New York-centric, but there are a lot of big things we did uh, in many domains as a group, uh, all the people who were trying to work and develop emergency medicine. And uh, look at how well uh, the principles that we use to, to deliver care to people have really expanded the capacity of all medicine to do much better with regard to the, the growth and development of students, residents, physicians and who've completed their training and everybody else is a member part of the team. I go, my uh, training in college or before really, I didn't know much about medicine at all. Uh, I had uh, very political parents and grandparents and so I knew R Rudolf Virchow and I remember that his sense of what uh, medicine really was going to be uh, and my parents were very political. Uh, so it's, it, I understood that political action was going to accomplish a lot that medicine did. And certainly Virchow showed that in the 1840s and 1850s in Germany. Uh, and that, that we are the advocates for the people. Uh, and that their social problems really uh, should largely be avoided. And so I took the principle, I, I learned a lot in my work in college uh, doing research on um, I guess Marasmus and Kwashiorkor in, uh, in England and looking on physical chemistry and quantum mechanics uh, in college. And it was a mixture of this great science and also the critical things that had to be done in the world and how would you get there and how would you accomplish that. And the model I had, often being near New York City and coming back to New York City, was that we would really have those people who had need, who were uh, terribly disenfranchised, suffering, didn't know much about what healthcare was going to be, didn't have access, um, and what, what we were supposed to do as doctors, and what that really meant to the development of, of our environment. I spent a little time uh, at medical school in the United States, uh, and I knew I wanted to go to Johns Hopkins when I finished uh, deciding where I wanted to go to medical school. I thought I wanted to do medicine, I wanted to go to Johns Hopkins. And so when I saw the doors, 
even when I went for my interview, I really, it was hard for me to believe and understand it. And so I, I appreciated this would be a good place to continue my interest in civil rights and civil resistance. Uh, and in principle, there was a dean there who didn't like that concept that much and really suggested that uh, it wasn't my responsibility to worry about those aspects of care that I was supposed to learn my biochemistry and other things of that nature. And I, I wasn't able to adjust to that, and so shortly thereafter, I was kicked out of school. Uh, but I went to Europe and began to expand my understanding of what medicine was and went to a country, uh, Belgium, at that point, that it had particularly well-developed socialized system of medicine. Uh, this is a quote from George Orwell. That's a vision of Bellevue Hospital, maybe in the 1980s. Uh, but George Orwell instead, you know, this, this concept of what a hospital was, there are a whole lot of things that were done. So, uh, and he was being, he would go into the hospital because he had tuberculosis and he didn't get much help in the process at all uh, because he wasn't that interested in what he felt. And so often people told us that and people talked about that process and um, the book that you may have read about, about the time that uh, just antecedent to when I was in Baltimore was Henrietta Lacks' uh, description of her cells and what life was like as being a patient in Baltimore in the 1950s and 60s. And Foucault, who was a uh, philosopher uh, in uh, Belgium and France at the time I was there, was the, the rise of scientific medicine. The poor and rich struck a Faustian bargain. The poor received treatment on the wards. In return, they gave their bodies to medical education. The rich benefited from this knowledge and in return endorsed and supported the hospitals. So sometimes we have to think about that as to why our hospitals look so different. And just as you go between uh, a public hospital and a private institution, you see the differences. And what I'll try to talk about is that each of these two hospitals, in my instance, has an immense amount to offer to society. Uh, neither of them does the whole thing. And how to see the differences between the two hospitals allows one to think about what's best to do and how to help in the change of the kind of health care we get. So I'm going to start with a story of a, a patient. And, I think all of us, when you read Sherlock Holmes, know that uh, representation, that story, that history, that narrative is what drives your capacity to reason. It's not enough to know that the person has diabetes mellitus. It's better to know whether the woman uh, speaks Chinese or the man speaks Spanish or the culture was distinctly different and how you're going to relate to that person effectively to do the things that have to be done to make the health care reasonable for that person. And in many instances, this debate, a lot of which is discussed in that Victoria Sweet book, I suggest, that there's a, uh, you can't do very fast medicine for a lot of people we see uh, in a busy emergency department. Uh, you have to go and start fast medicine, and then you can decide, once you debrief and stabilize and decide whether how you switch either to lots more fast medicine or very slow medicine that's going to take a while to get adequately accomplished what a person who doesn't speak English and doesn't have a uh, uh, much public health literacy and doesn't have much health literacy and really needs the kind of uh, developmental care that you can do. So there are special things that we do that no one else is going to do. And I'll try to emphasize that we're the only sanctuary in America where you can walk in and get care no matter what. So this is about a young girl. Uh, this is one of many books about the story of Libby Zion. Uh, it's made it into uh, the basic examination questions you get on toxicology boards. So this is from the uh, pharmacology exam at Columbia uh, Presbyterian or Columbia University in 1995. And you all know the answer today. And you all would have known the answer if you had an electronic medical record that worked well. And you'd be able to think about these things. And that became this, this particular concept about her case led to a lot of the things that I think we do in emergency medicine and medicine. So on March 4th, 1984, Libby Zion was 18 years old. She went to Bennington College. Her mother and father were journalists and powerful uh, political, um, had, with powerful political connections in the city of New York. Uh, Libby Zion had uh, agitation, fever, chills, myalgias, arthralgias, and a medical resident began her evaluation at uh, a hospital in New York, the New York Hospital. Uh, they were not, based upon the standards we had for the city of New York, uh, appropriate to receive ambulances yet. They hadn't gone through this process uh, that 
the 911 Committee of New York had stipulated that you had to have a person at the level of the third year at least in the emergency department involved in the care uh, when the patient re was received there. We were in the process of negotiating that and reviewing the hospitals to set up a categorization and regionalization of services in New York. And that was being done uh, by administrators, nurses, and physicians uh, from the various each emergency department involved, and that was being done with many consultants and support people. If we were talking about neurotrauma, we had the neurosurgeons and the neurologists, as well as the people in emergency medicine. That was established by 1203 grants from the Nixon administration in the 1970s. That led to what became the uh, Rocky Mountain Poison Center, the New York City Poison Center, with tremendous standards that Barry Rumack and I and a number of others uh, whose names would would be less meaningful to you today. We worked extensively for years in working through those standards uh, and worked on implementing those in many places across the country. So the medical history included a psychiatric treatment for stress, a recent tooth extraction, an earache. Her medications were phenylzine, oxycodone, and erythromycin. On admission, her temperature was 39.7, and she had an orthostatic blood pulse and blood pressure changes determined. The young one's private attending refused to come to the hospital. The family called because they thought the patient was quite sick. The physicians in the emergency department was not, were not that impressed. The resident made a diagnosis of viral syndrome with hysterical symptoms, obtained blood cultures, and prescribed acetaminophen for fever and meparidine for agitation and shivering. The young one was admitted to the medical service under the care of a medical intern and resident. The intern was called when the patient became restless and disoriented. And rather than evaluate the patient, she ordered by telephone physical restraints and haloperidol. The patient uh, became more agitated, febrile of 42 degrees centigrade, and the intern was again called and she ordered a cooling blanket. Four and a half hours after the admission, the patient experienced a respiratory arrest and died. They didn't do mortality and morbidities the way you did today in an ethical, humanistic fashion. But this, this death um, certainly bothered the parents. Uh, they felt it was unnecessary. They felt it was terrible care. They went through a battle to get things started. Um, and you know, when people talked about it, you can see the, that list, all of those might have been an acceptable part of the differential diagnosis. That's not something that uh, the people involved in that case did. And those are the things we would have talked about if it were done this morning. At that point, this debate was going on in our city. But what is the role of emergency medicine? Is it just a pass-through system? Uh, is universities to be supportive? At that time in the city of New York, or across the country, when we looked at which hospitals had uh, emergency medicine programs, or had academic departments, or had residencies, what you end up, ended up finding was there was an inverse correlation between the academicity, the NIH ranking of the medical school, and the development of an emergency medicine program. So that the more dollars you got from NIH, the less you had invested in emergency medicine programs. And so that that persisted for years, and only recently have some of our most famous institutions developed emergency medicine programs whereas other aspects of their system, such as a public hospital, might have a program. And so what was that really about? So when one often thought, you know, uh, what's the purpose of our educational process? And that was the debate that was bothering that, by this is the 1980s Libby Zion case, that was bothering me significantly because there was no hope for a department run in a place such as Bellevue, which had immense support uh, when you couldn't say to a young person who is either trained in emergency medicine, you're going to be able to teach residents and students to develop into emergency physicians because you weren't going to be allowed to do that. That was blocked. And that was many places. And so that the people I worked with, myself and others, none of us uh, got any faculty advancement, such as the Peter Rosen who worked here uh, about the same time I was working there. Uh, they got their credentials from the Oregon Health Sciences. They didn't get it from the University of Colorado. I, by this time, shortly after this case started, the Libby Zion case, I lost all my communication with the dean's office. 
Um, and prior to that, there was a debate over really whether emergency medicine should exist, and I'll show you some of this debate. The reason I lost relationship with the dean's office is that this is, uh, on the right is uh, Henry Morgenthau, who was the, uh, excuse me, on, on the, uh, on our, your, your right now, I guess, your left, is Henry Morgenthau, the guy that's hard to see. He was the district attorney at that time, very famous, long-standing. And next to him is a guy named John Freed. John Freed happened to be, live a few houses down from me in the country. So as soon as the case occurred, several of us knew about the case, but as soon as the case occurred, John Freed said they'd been talking about this tremendous pressure from the mayor and uh, from the Zion family that these uh, house officers should be considered uh, guilty of negligence. So knowing much about emergency medicine by that time, my response to John Freed is I would be happy to work with them on this case and help develop the process, but that I did not feel that the emergent, that the two young doctors in the emergency department were emergency physicians, nor should they be expected to know anything they were doing, nor should they have been there without supervision, nor should they have been so tired they couldn't go back to the bedside of this woman to do what had to be done, nor did they know any of the therapeutic interventions or decisions. So if they wanted me to help them, I would work with them continuously on this process because I thought it would be revolutionary for the development of emergency medicine in New York City and in the country. Uh, and I thought it would help us immensely with regard to the, the implications of what, what would good toxicology be uh, for our education and for our patients. And so I agreed. The only time in my career, from 1979 to today, that I ever took a car to work is John Freed drove his car, and he drove me to work every day, and we went back together every evening uh, for um, about two or three months. We worked on the case and developing the process and the kind of people who would get together and talk about this issue. That led ultimately uh, to this uh, New York Supreme Court decision, which really set up the same emergency department standards that we had worked on based upon these 1203 grants from the federal government, plus uh, the efforts that would develop to the principles of emergency medicine for our city, that it were to apply to every hospital that would have the right to receive an ambulance, that were supervised and decided upon by approximately 60 doctors and 60 nurses and 60 administrators without the influence of anybody outside the system except when you were looking at neonatal transfers, when you were looking at poisoning, when you were looking at trauma, that all the people involved in those were involved in setting up what the standards were for the city. Uh, we said that those same proposed standards should be for the New York State and that the New York State mental hygiene law should be changed with regard to how people were cared for. And you know that, that the sequence of events not directly related to this for everything that happened across the country. But, you know, these, this was a woman put in uh, bed restraints. This is a woman who was, had an altered consciousness. Who is going to see anybody today would say that's not a person who has a psychiatric problem, may have a psychiatric problem days before, but right now had a life-threatening, agitated delirium at the least. So we went through those basic issues. That ultimately, the recommendations, there were five major recommendations that came out of it that at least three years of training for all patients, all in the emergency room, there had to be at least one person supervising at all times. There had to be contemporaneous in-person supervision by attendings or those who've completed three years of training. Uh, so that you had, had to have timely, immediate, at that moment, supervision. That was unheard of in our specialty or any place else in the hospital at that time. And that we, as you, even at a place like ours uh, over the years, we could see people who had critically ill patients, we'd stabilize them with good work in the emergency room, they'd go upstairs to an intensive care unit where there were only residents doing the work. So it, it, was a, it was an issue throughout the entirety of the system, and ultimately, everybody who was involved in that, um, the, the uh, Morgenthau and the Freed, and all the people who were brought for consultation, many began to enunciate these as principles that we needed to work on. Standards for restraints, standards for consecutive hours, and computerized drug ordering. We said that if we had electronic medical record, obviously I had very little knowledge about that. Anything I knew might have been taught to me recently by Christmas Day, but I uh, learned a great deal about this process. That, in that era, that's uh, 
30 years ago, I had great aspirations that this was going to solve our problems. Um, I obviously don't have as many much confidence today, but we may, made a great progress. People would have known some things and we maybe wouldn't have known how to override the process at that point. So the, uh, the conclusion of the Supreme Court, we have made these recommendations with the hope that future hospital patients will receive more experienced professional medical care than did this unfortunate young woman. The uh, many people were very much opposed to that which we did. Robert Petersdorf, one of our most famous physicians, uh, I think, for uh, either I guess either fever of unknown origin or persistent perplexing pyrexia, one of the two uh, big areas. Uh, great textbook, very important fellow. Continuity of care is better to have a tired doctor who knew the case than a rested one who only reads the chart. Uh, shorter hours lead to lost experience. Medicine is a calling, not a job. Once patients over other considerations, fixed schedule e equals shift mentality. So you can see there's a bit of truth and a lot of falsehood in that, and that's been that's debated for some time. It's been there's been a revisionist approach. There are a host of things you could discuss about this, uh, but he said uh, in the committee that we ultimately had to get together for the state of New York was that we we interviewed every chair of surgery and medicine in the state of New York in a committee that was established by David Axelrod, who was the Commissioner of Health. And we had on that committee nine additional people uh, besides myself, uh, head, of, uh, head of ambulatory care, a couple of deans, a couple of people who were chair of, me chair of medicine, chair of surgery, all to talk about what the future of medicine should be and what the regulations of the state, how they should be implemented. And uh, Petersdorf, as head of the AMC, was made very important comments. Many people, all of the heads of surgery and medicine said everything we talked about was totally unnecessary and unacceptable. Ultimately, uh, these debates that came up and people from New Zealand came to talk about the number of hours they had and it's education, education, service, fatigue, uh, what are the human factors and fatigue, lots of things that we talk about, loss of creativity, loss of virtue. Uh, can you be humanistic when you're tired? Can you do something critical when you're so tired? Loss of altruism and empathy. So there are tremendous problems we felt. Uh, we don't have answers to these. We didn't have answers to these at that point either. So the New York State Health Code regulations were going to be established. But we, we met for two years. By, by the time the dean found out I was involved in helping the district attorney, he say he forbade me from going to the work. So I lost that part in this discussion. Obviously, I said I couldn't listen to what he said. Fortunately, there's nothing that he could do to me in those days because he wasn't willing to pay me and he wasn't willing to promote me. And so all my work was at Bellevue Hospital. So that, and, and that start began a level of hostility. You can imagine that it was, it would be difficult to tolerate if you didn't have a good vision of where you were going with this whole process. So we worked extensively with many people saying that what we were doing was absurd and that everybody would say, some of the things would say, you know, why do you need emergency physicians? I have, Bellevue Hospital has, I can give you, they would say, uh, someone the chief of surgery or neurosurgery or medicine, I give you cardiologists, neurologists, gastroenterologists, they're at the beck and call immediately available. And obviously, you know that what you were getting was either a, a resident who was on rotation in that service, you were getting a fellow in that service, but there were no attendings in the hospital. The first attendings ever full-time in the hospital at Bellevue Hospital were people we had in the emergency department. And we could get wonderful people in the emergency department to work. But ultimately, they would say, this is an intolerable place for some of the things, same thing that Rick Darda said. The battles were enormous. Um, and so I... It was very hard on a lot of the faculty. They said, this is a wonderful mission you have, uh, but it's a tough job. Uh, and so I would explain to people that uh, you, uh, you know, th this is a critical issue. We're defending the rights of people to get good care, rich and poor. They're all entitled to have faculty supervising. They're, we have all have to learn what to do. Even those who are being trained, emergency medicine had only had first residencies in 70, few people then, many places had them by the 80s. We were in the mid 80s and still there were very few people who wanted to try this experiment of coming to work at Bellevue to help me. So the New York State Health Codes became, uh, residents were limited to 80 hour work weeks. No more than 24 hours consecutively, at least 24 hours off per week, the maximum of 12 hours in the ED. And we really switched to that in the emergency department. The rest of the hospital 
took some time to do some of these things. But in, in this we built, there had to be contemporaneous supervision in the hospital and in the emergency department. And that was the thing that was basically resisted continuously in the hospital to have contemporaneous supervision. So although we were doing that, the rest of the hospital was not complying in the least with that. And so that we were still admitting people to unsupervised areas. And that ultimately became more and more uh, aggressive intervention on part of the state with regard to the, um, the process of the in-hospital services. Sidney Zion wrote a piece in the uh, New York Times. This is, uh, you know, almost uh, 30 years ago. Last month, the New York State Medical Society demanded David Axelrod's resignation for issuing oppressive, arbitrary, and unnecessarily burdensome regulations. Then the Hospital Association of New York State brought suit to enjoin him from implementing rules. Uh, there was immense pressure on Mario Cuomo to remove this guy. He was at the same time really one of the most heroic people in the country standing up against doctors having the obligate, Jesse Helms suggested all of us who worked in hospitals with lots of patients with AIDS had to get tested routinely, uh, that we'd have to have our blood tested to conduct, carry on with our work to discuss the care. And Axelrod stood up and really was a great advocate for the improvement of care for people with uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, in addition to standing up for the uh, rights and responsibilities of physicians in the care. And we were able to maintain a number of staff who had HIV and AIDS at that time as professionals and where they could perform and really understood the patient population far better than most of us. So even in emergency medicine, one of our, another exceptional guy, Bob Knopp, who you still may see as an editor at reviewing editorial work for the annals, there was a piece he wrote at that point where there were, the battle was, what were we going to do? What kind of supervision would we as emergency physicians do? Because the, the questions were really raised, you know, uh, how is the resident going to really learn all these important things if he or she doesn't get to do it by himself or herself alone at night? And, you know, it, it's a little tough when the census isn't so great at night. Maybe we don't need faculty then. Uh, and maybe uh, we don't really need them on the weekends all the time because it's slower than two. And so what were we going to become as especially really will evolve from this process. How are we going to retain the best faculty if we made them work these hours that no one else ever did? And those questions uh, he framed very well, and those were the debates we had in meetings uh, continuously at this stage of the evolution of the process. So the, the biggest issues were really, you know, how do you um, meet the needs of patients and the needs of your education, and what does supervision do to that process? Can you really maintain the things that you think are essential uh, with regard to independence and dependence. Can a good attending work carefully with a, with a good resident and do a, a remarkable job? And you, you need to understand that those of us who started to learn emergency medicine, let's say when I became a doctor or when I was a student, there wasn't anybody to supervise me. I was on 24 hours and then I was off 24 hours and I was on with three other interns. No one else worked in the emergency department. Uh, and the patients weren't any healthier in the South Bronx in 1970 than they are in a battle zone anyplace else. It was everything that you have to do and we were there doing work with such limited knowledge that you couldn't accomplish the task with responsibility. And so we always had to go home feeling that we'd made a terrible error and we'd let people down. This is a piece uh, by Paul Farmer. It's a reminder of how you can make your emergency department work, I think. You can't sympathize with the staff too much, or you risk not sympathizing with the patients. So you've got to be great to push people, and you've got to understand that the patients are first, and there's really got to be that kind of quality of service uh, that not everybody likes to practice. Uh, everybody, there's got to be a, the right way and the wrong way to give criticism, the right way and the wrong way to work on things. But people have got to know when there's trouble, when they're not doing things that are ideal for the patient in front of them. And the other thing is about uh, trying to be well and help to be well and to understand how you function is that when we cut the hours down, we believe that to, to deliver care as an emergency physician, you had to be vigilant. Uh, with laser-like precision on each of your patients, on each of the staff you work with all of the time, and that people had to have the capacity to be healthy at home as well as at work to deliver that kind of service. So the things we, we felt, we wanted to create an environment where we had a physician-teacher model that was ideal, the attending, and 
the students and residents are entitled to mature models. Uh, there was too much that was cavalier, too much that was not evidence-based. We had to get some knowledge. We had to study what we were doing. We had to develop people who had the strength to perform the kind of care that we think is essential, that we would like our mothers or our fathers or our friends, our children to get. And that was not the kind of care that we were given. We could not achieve that because we didn't have enough knowledge and we didn't have enough system. We thought just as this meeting is attended by maybe many more residents uh, than you would have had in the past, conferences didn't, there wasn't enough free time. There wasn't the idea that the resident should be liberated from service during a certain percentage of each week uh, to do it at morning report, to do it at conferences such as this, um, and that there had to be this contemporaneous supervision. Everybody complained about it, thought about how would the resident develop skills, but contemporaneous supervision from my perspective is a transformative effort. I think that uh, I still like to do my clinical work. I think that I can find something to teach somebody or that they can watch me do something that allows them to learn each and every day. And the whole system works that way. And we, you may not feel that you know everything about being independent as a young person, but you know a great deal about watching people who have exceptional skills do things. And because of that intimacy of relationship, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> And as a reminder, Virchow said that medical education does not exist to provide students a way of making a living, but to ensure the health of the community. I think that's a reminder of what, we, what the hospital is there for. And so that it's that kind of theme um, is prominent for all of us to think about what, what it is that this hospital does, what, why are you seeing this patient, what can you do for this patient, the difference in having that philosophy and having a restrictive philosophy, which was historic uh, throughout the healthcare system, is important. Petersdorf came back to a meeting we had at the New York Academy of Medicine several years after the, his previous comments. And he said, my wish would be that the profession had been more perceptive and recognized the issues and making the appropriate changes. He had said, ironically, that he was the chair of medicine at, uh, I think, San Diego, uh, prior to that at the University of Washington. And he was he would say something cavalier on, I've never seen a resident at Morning Report who was tired and couldn't present a brilliant case. So you know that some of you and some of us have been quite tired. We worked on ambulance systems, we worked on supervision, we worked on receiving hospitals. We said the ambulance system was not going anywhere unless the system was well developed. The standard was there in the emergency department, the receiving hospital had principles. So. Uh, many people have written books about uh, Bellevue, but this is, a, this is a senior thesis. This is a PhD thesis by S Sandra Updike, who it's worth maybe reading. You can read it, but it's certainly it's the difference between the two hospitals. I alluded to it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the two-track system. There's something worse than a two-track system of medicine, and that is one-track system for which, from which many persons are excluded. Private hospitals have never fulfilled the city's needs, nor are they likely to. Public hospitals for more than 250 years, through beleaguered, though beleaguered, have picked up the tasks undone to meet human needs. They have played an essential part in the humanizing life in New York City. So public hospitals and private hospitals do remarkable things. Combining them in something that's more than either of them can do would be a great accomplishment. The things that some people, you know, a place like Bellevue Hospital, when I had, was dealt with the AIDS crisis and the enormity of the homelessness, we had three social workers 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the emergency department in the 1970s, 1980s, early 1980s. You know, we had lots of social services. We had teams in the, in the homeless shelter that was adjacent. There were many things that could do that had to solve the problem. Everything should have been preventive. Everything could be done outside the hospital, but if it wasn't being done, the people we were seeing needed much more support than could be had elsewhere. Remember that EMTALA didn't exist until 1986, when people across the country, I think one of the leaders probably would have been Arthur Kellerman, who brought all of those name bands that were on his patients that he collected. We did the same in New York State through the state legislature. We could get, in a, in a week, I could get 100 name bands off a patient who had been sent from someplace else, you know, 10 patients, 20 patients, sent from someplace else, transferred to us. This comatose man uh, from the Upper East Side would prefer to be cared for at Bellevue Hospital. 
this, this psychiatric patient was seen by you. Yes, he had been seen 10 years before, but he'd been followed everywhere else in between. A host of issues that that was allowed. You could send anybody there and you could send anybody away you wanted. And so that the kind of distribution of human beings was based upon economic imperative or in some places it was the interest imperative. I don't want anybody else tonight admitted to my service. I'm only going to take someone unless if the patient has lupus or something that, that I really need to learn as opposed to someone who needs to come in. Provide any patient who comes to the emergency department with an appropriate medical screening examination to determine whether emergency exists. Provide necessary stabilizing treatment for emergency medical uh, conditions and labor. Provide an appropriate transfer of a patient if patient requests. Not delay examination and or treatment to inquire about insurance status or payment. It simplified the care for most people and most services. It was a part of the additional part of democratization of our effort. So the, the typical battle we had, we, we still didn't have a residency during all these things. It wasn't enhanced uh, by my participation in those efforts uh, in principle with the medical school, but it was, I think, in the, in the city and state. For all the state universities in New York began to develop emergency medicine training programs. There was agreement that would be a solution uh, to the need. We were going to set standards that every hospital had to have emergency trained people within several years. Three years of training in some fashion would be acceptable until then. But the goal was the Commissioner of Health agreed that we should set a standard that they had to have emergency physicians to call an emergency department. And that could only be done if you train new people and they had access to the appropriate opportunities. So that a guy named Howard French, a man who I've talked with hundreds of times, I talked with every week uh, for two or three years, where he was the health reporter for the Times. I talked with all the people who were health reporters for every journal in the city of New York and many of the, the television stations, um, because I couldn't get the message out of what had to be done. I didn't go to the meetings in the dean's office, nor meet with the other chairs of departments, because they were all told by the dean that we were not going to work on emergency medicine. So I had to, I liked to go to meetings. So I went to the community board of the city of, of, of the Bellevue Hospital and the Bellevue Hospital community board. And I went to those every month and I reported to them uh, what I thought care was like and how we could improve it if we had residency training in emergency medicine. I said, it is true that you can get people to come and see your, your family member, but I'd like someone who is trained in emergency medicine to, to be able to assess whether the person's got a need sutures in the hand, what sutures they need, or what, whether the person needs a stent uh, or needs an effort in the brain or the heart. So that uh, talking to people about the big problems they had uh, leaked out into the press. It didn't leak out. I spoke to the press routinely. The comments uh, occurred. The, the dean said that a responsible faculty member does not speak to the press without the dean's approval. So I said, well, I, I didn't think we had a good enough relationship that we were going to talk about that. So I, we just stopped worrying about it. I did what I thought I had to do, uh, and he did his. I don't know if those of you have seen this Henri Cartier-Bresson image of uh, these two nuns looking at uh, Matisse's Dans son Ronde. So this is, in the, uh, this is at the... Uh, at MoMA, Metropolitan, uh, the Modern Museum of Art in New York. And this is a little bit like, he said there would be a residency in emergency medicine over his dead body. Um, I said that when I would explain this to, uh, from an educational point of view, I would say the deans would look like those two nuns, and they'd be looking at what we were doing as something absurd and un difficult to understand. The gap between what the deans felt about emergency medicine and the leaders of medicine felt about emergency medicine were substantial. So after talking with the community board for some time, the community board said, if you don't allow an emergency medicine residency to develop at Bellevue Hospital, we're not going to permit New York University medical students to go and study at Bellevue Hospital any longer. They'd only been going for 150 years, so that would have been a big blow for <clears throat> New York University. But it was a battle over whether the community board, obviously very supportive of my efforts, and uh, Howard French, who wrote extensively in the New York Times about this. We had a piece in the New York Times maybe every week or every other week for several years about emergency medicine and what it was doing. Because 
there were plenty of problems in emergency departments um, that were, were obviously uh, had to be addressed. It would have been addressed better in a forum that was an academic forum, but it wouldn't be successful for some much substantial amount of time. So this this led uh, to what was called uh, another good friend, a woman in Heidi, Heidi Evans, wrote routinely in the Daily News, tug of war at Bellevue. Uh, the chief residents of the medical service wrote well, this one is not. This is the Howard French dealing with looking again at the difference. This debate, and this debate was all across the country. Actually, one of uh, Richard's uh, mentors is listed here as one of our proponents. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a piece by uh, the comment in this long document by Alistair Khan, who suggested that maybe emergency medicine with trained faculty wasn't actually as essential as others thought. So that we, you could find some people in. Uh, uh, emergency medicine who didn't believe that we should all be having emergency medicine residencies. So there was a certain schism, but this the die was advancing. Then you would get the chief residents from the Department of Medicine would say, large hospitals have less need for emergency medicine training. So you'd, everybody would be speaking up, but we were in the center. Um, and so the way I tried to um, keep staff is to say things, bring out existential thought. You know, in truth, if no one, if one ought always to ask oneself what would happen if everyone did as one is doing. You just had to move on and do this. This was a battle that many were fighting in many ways across the country uh, because we were never going to be able to do our job unless we solved this problem. So in 1992, we got a residency, and uh, the first years uh, were probably were very difficult, much as uh, Rick Dart just suggested. Uh, they were difficult before that. They were less difficult for the patients. Uh, because we got very fine people um, who were very committed and lots of people uh, who ultimately transformed the way healthcare is provided at our hospitals. Ultimately, as in most of these battles, you can see I didn't have communication with the dean for some time, still into the 90s. Faculty still weren't promoted. There was no involvement in the medical school. But by about four years after the residency started at Bellevue, uh, the medical school decided that they did want to have our residence because the reputation was so good. Uh, he said, the dean said, now that you have faculty, so we had the same people who were not allowed to have physicians, the agreement with the city of New York and the mayor and the governor was that we, our faculty would take a two-year period of time where they were evolving their development and then be given appropriate appointments in the medical school. So that was the trade-off in the end of the process. Um, we, had, we had no ability for many years into the late 90s to get any grants because the dean's office would not sign off on any grant that we were working on. So that the things we did in great part were through the New York City Poison Center, which was not part of the medical school. And through uh, a couple of uh, the Aaron Diamond Foundation, where a number of foundations we went to, the dean wasn't so interested in Diamond Foundations because they didn't have a, overhead was not given. But the kind of support we had from a number of foundations was really to look at some of the problems of society. Uh, one of our staff got uh, an environmental medicine uh, fellowship through the Diamond Foundation for a number of years and then further to work on hyperthermia. We said it was related to the <clears throat> uh, Libby Zion case. We could do demonstration of how we could improve that across the city in terms of education. Someone else got funds for better care of prisoners. So we had to do things outside of the mainstream of the system, but that led to the development of intellectuals in the process who would do things. So, you know, the, the issue about emergency medicine um, it's led us to so much work in patient safety, as the m and discussed today, and innovation. Uh, the idea of Peter Bruegel is that you've got to know the community. You've got to know what people are doing, what jobs they have, what tasks uh, they do that are on the books, or off the books, how people live, what the homes are like. You had to know much about the society in which we serve. We then, about that time, decided I was, I think, the, either the president of the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine or about to become Louis Ling, who was the president about that same time as well. He and I both went to the Josiah Macy Foundation in uh, New York. Uh, we wrote a peace uh, proposal on uh, having a, a meeting that uh, showed the role of emergency medicine, the future of uh, American medical care. Uh, this was exceptionally helpful to us, and there are six points. The, the leader of the Macy Foundation was a very devoted guy. 
the way that this works is you get, you say, what are the five or six big things you want to do? And those become the, the conclusions of the, of, the, of the work. You design those in advance. You get core people to write up good papers about the, the future of emergency medicine, research in emergency medicine, the academicity of emergency medicine. And you debate those. You go to a room that's, uh, you know, 25% this size, and you sit there for several days and work out a, an agreement. Everyone willing to go there for you get surgeons, you get trauma people, you get internists, primary care people, you would get uh, newspaper writers, you get a few ethicists, you get a couple of people from emergency medicine, and everyone talk and come out with some conclusions that became the future of emergency medicine. So that we were very concerned uh, that um, we opened access to high quality emergency medical care and it would be available to all persons in need without attribution of any sort. We wanted, number two, that federal, state, and local governmental organizations, including COGME, should ensure that the number of residency positions in emergency medicine were not diminished, as other specialties were going to have at that point. That was at least the thought. We had never developed in many places across the country. The third was that the Joint Commission should revise the classification of emergency departments, and the classification should reflect the level of care available. Very specific by what each hospital was. Level one trauma, no trauma. Level two, things of this nature. Could they receive cardiac cases? Could they receive psychiatric cases? Could they receive children? All of these standards had to be established. We wanted the Joint Commission to take a harsher stance on this. We wanted qualifications for physicians, nurses, and other health professionals who provide services in the EDs. We subsequently wrote a paper to come out simultaneously or shortly thereafter on emergency center categorization standards. Not particularly well received in emergency medicine, uh, but the, the principles were there. These were a lot like those same standards we developed for the city of New York <clears throat> that we presented at that stage. The state licensing boards and medical schools, deans and faculties must ensure that every medical student has acquired the appropriate knowledge and skills to care for emergency patients. We wanted students to have the right to be trained. We thought that it would be best that every student either had to take or had the right to take uh, training in emergency medicine as a student, that you didn't have to have a situation <clears throat> where students were not prepared, uh, whether they were did anything else. We weren't interested in them all becoming emergency physicians. We were interested in them becoming physicians capable of responding to an emergency. Uh, it was important that ASEP and SAM stop quibbling and get together and design a sense of where research should go in emergency medicine. And we thought that deans and faculty of all LCME accredited medical schools with the assistance of the AAMC and the AAHC should establish in their schools appropriately, uh, appropriately stated and supported academic departments in emergency medicine. Remember, this is this follow-up to there really was the very few of the exemplary research schools had emergency medicine as an academic environment. And so this became the push that today is almost realized this fully in America. In those days, uh, there were a substantial number of departments that did not exist. So by the, by the time we were reaching the end of this battle era, the new dean said there's no reason for a department. Why emergency medicine? What are the benefits? You have more full-time staff than any other department at Bellevue Hospital. You have all the people you need. What do you need to have a department? Uh, you have more dollars. I'll promote you to professor. They, these were the last gestures of a fellow. You can, hit, you can head a division of medicine, submit the evidence, white papers. So if any of you have ever met a, a problem that couldn't be solved, that you were driven to do lots of white papers, you know how frustrating that is. So I was, did this for several times and then just said there was, it wasn't going to work this way. So fortunately, or I guess this dragged on until 2001 or so. And <clears throat> we got a, uh, this is a statement by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, that was about this time we talked about, not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how to, <clears throat> the strong man stumbles or where the, the doer of deeds could have done better. And the World Trade Center was bombed in 2001. And the, um, the battles were going on in the city. The mayor was Giuliani. 
<clears throat> and his big backer was a guy who was exceptionally reactionary and certainly a pro-Trump guy, but came to visit the emergency department in 2001 and saw the work we were doing. This was a fellow named Ken Langone who would say uh, that he, he said, you're doing remarkable work. He said, I'm to the, he would tell me, he'd tell other people when he's being cute, he'd say, I'm to the right of Genghis Khan. That's what this Ken Langone would say. And said, you're to the left of Marx. And we agree entirely that we have to have a training program in emergency medicine. We need an academic department. And uh, I'll get it for you. So then by that time, I was, old, I was invited to uh, faculty meetings, dean's meetings. And every time there was a party, uh, Langone would say, he'd come and see me, said, did you get at the department yet? And I'd say, obviously not. And so he'd yell across to the room to Bob, the dean, and say, if you don't give this guy a department, we can't support you in anything. This is a horrible thing. You have to have a department of emergency medicine. So ultimately, we got a Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, what's graduate medical education? The principles are accepted in, in, the, in the ED. Acceptance in the hospital is essential to the future of medicine. Uh, supervision is capitalizing the E in GME. I think we do that very well. I think that's something that was difficult for the rest of the hospital. Uh, these are the big issues that we debate. I don't think I need this. This is a reminder of the complexity of our task. Some of you may know this um, this picture. This is Diana Arbus's picture of the patient, the, the patient, Eddie Carmel, the giant, who was the gentle giant of Ringling Brothers, of great fame, when Marty Cohn, who was our first uh, program director in our emergency medicine effort, who was trained by Peter Rosen in Chicago, I think. Marty Cohn and I were uh, interns at uh, Montefiore Hospital when Eddie Carmel came into the emergency department with uh, uh, cerebral apoplexy. He hemorrhaged into his pituitary tumor. He had acromegaly and gigantism. So that, was, that demonstrated to me and to Marty Cohn who Knowing how to resuscitate a man who was 550 pounds and eight foot five and had skin so thick, we, none of the needles we had could get through his skin. And it taught us, we knew he came in with a bad headache uh, and he, he was really losing consciousness and that he had been untreated. We had, he had radiation, he had, he's had radiation, he had, had dissect, resection. And this was really the end of his life. And we worked very hard, but we, we couldn't do that resuscitation. It really taught us that lots had to be due. This is 1970, 71. We couldn't do the work. And we knew it then, and we've known it for, many of us have known this for a long time, and that we had to do, had to develop the kind of things that you all represent today, the kind of medicine that you represent. And it can be exceptionally complex problems, technically, socially, philosophically. Uh, but the last paragraph of um, Sidney Zion's piece in the New York Times, on the other hand, if we wake up, make our voices heard, one day they'll teach in medical schools around the world. Once upon a time in America, the finest hospitals were run by the least experienced and most overworked apprentice doctors. Until one night in New York, a red-headed girl named Libby Zion. So sure, putting all these together is our job this medical health care system, the public health system, the emergency response system. And many of our people don't have a chance to get a great part of this. And how we do it each and every day for each person to make it reasonable is a very demanding task and uses lots of your creativity, but there's lots of structure that's been developed to be able to take full advantage of this. These three books were uh, uh, work of the early 2000s. Uh, really looking through the National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, Institute of Medicine, effort to really look at what are the things of the future for emergency medicine? What are the problems? What are the issues that you need to address for emergency care, EMS, and hospital-based care? And they're worth reading for everybody who's a faculty member or a resident or a student to really think about the issues. Many of the dilemmas that we faced and will continue to face into the future are described there and really are, showed a devotion on the part of uh, really the National Academies, to, to begin to solve the issues that we confront every single day. So from an, a public hospital point of view, my sp perspective almost has always been 
that almost everything that we see could be prevented, whether it's if we did a better job before people got to the emergency department. So we treated hypertension wherever you have to treat it, in the mosques or in the barber shops, wherever you have to go to do something so people don't come to the emergency department with end-stage kidney disease. But you work on hypertension and diabetes, you work on poison prevention, you work on trauma prevention, you create cars that are safe, you create the houses and vehicles, and so that you can think this way, and so that our sense is that every emergency physician can find something that she or he is exceptionally impressed by to solve uh, that really will allow you to do care better before people get here, to find a way to tackle a problem that others haven't addressed. This was a uh, public hospital in American medical education. <clears throat> Those are four chairs of, of academic departments at NYU could all agree, all agree uh, really about the tremendous contribution of training of physicians and other health professionals uh, in an appropriately staffed and thoughtful public hospital. It has tremendous opportunities for all of us to think about the principles we want to maintain as we begin to fuse all of the things, and we talked about fusing what we did at both our hospitals, all of our hospitals, to make sure that the care and the system and the principles were universal between all the hospitals in which we worked. I believe that there are certain things you would learn in a place like Bellevue where you see uh, 150 different nations represented every month in the emergency department and people of every type under every circumstance at all times and to deliver the kind of care that you could be proud of for someone who, whose language you spoke and culture you knew and to recognize how difficult it is when we're culturally incompetent to deal with people from every, every part of the world simultaneously. Uh, this is um, the last words of a great uh, it was a great Bellevue physician <clears throat> who uh, did infectious disease and really was studied a lot of ethics during the AIDS epidemic. And a spirit of ten stinginess is threatening the nation's hospitals of last resort. Within public hospitals' walls that lie the few square miles in this country where health care is an unequivocal right, unquestioned right, not a grudgingly granted privilege. It's a good feeling to be in these spaces. We should create more of them. This is what I use as a uh, Summation of when I when I look at what medical toxicologists and emergency physicians who I've worked with, who've either trained or trained me or worked together, and we think about us all across the country, that almost every imaginable job on that board has been filled by an emergency physician or a medical toxicologist or both, and that the the capacity to respond to the public's needs and the uncertainties of our society are well done by all of you in the room. Everybody can do something very substantial, and everyone can do it in a fashion that's probably much better than lots of other people because of the kind of training you've had. And I, I think I'd, I'll show you one thing before I end. This is just an example of the people who have tried to have work with us who are uh, investigators. I've asked them, and I'll ask almost every student who comes to interview to say, I'd like you to work on something. I'd like you to be a revolutionary. To look at what's the lesion in the public health system that you are most excited about correcting? What's the thing you'd like to do? Sure, we can work on a great antidote. We can work on a nice technology piece. And some of you will do that. But if you look at the people who are in trouble, this guy came to Bellevue because he wanted to study alcoholics. He wanted to study alcoholism and solve the problem. He wanted to know why those people lie on the street all the time and everybody walks past them and neglects them. He wanted to create a solution. He's now gone through a series of papers that really looked at the voices of those people, the problems they had, how they were addressed, did they have capacity, did they not have capacity, did they have the ability to get a solution within what we had. And now he's using naltrexone to homeless men who come to the emergency department comatose and been able to initiate a treatment regimen that allows him to be able to get those people on naltrexone to get up and function again and to stop their drinking. And there's one other, just as another example, this young woman came to us. She said she spent her entire life since she was a little girl working in soup kitchens in Washington or when she went to Harvard and did work and set up Cambridge Square shelter. She said, I want to prevent homelessness. So I have to go to Bellevue 
because I won't understand what homelessness is like until I see as many people as I would see there. So she now has NIH grants to prevent homelessness. She's working on the algorithm to define how to accomplish that task. And we have a host of other people who do things like that so that the research can exist everywhere and a department fosters that kind of support for whatever people can do that makes a difference in our society. So thanks for my visit and thanks for listening.